All right, so here's the flow chart for a for loop. A for loop has the same four basic parts of any looping structure. The syntax is just a little bit more complicated, and honestly, we're just not familiar with it yet. Um, we're going to see that for certain cases, I think it's a much better option than a while loop. And actually, once we get comfortable with it, we'll at, we're more likely to write code that doesn't have bugs. And I'll explain what that means as we go. So here's the different parts of our for loop. We start off with initialization, um, just like we had with the while loop, except it's part of the for statement. After we initialize our loop variable, we then evaluate the condition um, in exactly the same manner as we did with the while loop. If the Boolean expression evaluates to true, we will then run the body of the for loop. Here's where the sequence of execution gets odd. After we run the body of the for loop, we then run part of the for statement that often increments, but really just updates the loop variable in some way. And then we check the condition again. And as we step through in the debugger, we're going to see like that flow of execution is kind of odd. If the condition is still true, great. We run the body of the for loop again. We then run the part of the for statement where we update the loop variable. We check the condition again. Eventually, that condition evaluates to false, and we're done. Okay. So it's just going to take us a little bit of time to get used to the syntax and the flow of execution for a for statement. So let's create another method here so that you can see an example of a for loop. So we'll do another public static void for example. And we'll capture a couple notes about a for loop. So I mentioned that every looping structure has these four different elements, initialization, condition, body, and updating the loop variable. The for statement puts three of those four elements all within the for statement, all within the same set of parentheses. So there are three parts of the for loop statement. The first part is the initialization. That part's pretty intuitive. That's not too bad. The initialization, as we would expect, is executed just once at the very beginning. The second part is the condition. This is the part that's just like the condition of a while loop. Okay. So this is a Boolean expression that is evaluated at the start of each iteration, just like it is in a while loop. Before we ever execute the body, we're going to evaluate the Boolean expression. If it's true, the body gets executed. If it's false, it doesn't. We skip to the end. And the third part of the for statement is where we update the loop variable. This is the part that I think is, is the most confusing or the least intuitive, because this third part of the loop statement, it is executed at the end of each iteration before evaluating the condition, condition again. And I think that's what is going to take us a little bit of getting used to. When you see four statements written um, in other code or online or in Stack Overflow or even in our textbook, um, the for statement is often written on a single line of code. I'm not going to do it that way for the next few days because I want you to very clearly see that the for statement is made up of three different parts. And when we run the BlueJ debugger, it's going to be much easier to understand the flow of execution if each of those three parts is on a separate line. So for the next few days, let's write our for loops on three separate lines. And then once we're comfortable with how they work, then we can put it all on a single line of code. So on the first line, we start with for. And we start with parentheses, just like we would with a while statement. And the first part of the for statement is the initialization. So we're going to have a local variable count of type int, and we're going to initialize it to 1. That's exactly what we did before the while loop in the previous example. 
So this is the initialization part. Semicolons separate each of the three parts of our for statement. So we have int count equals one semicolon. That's the end of the first part of the for statement, but we're not done with the for statement. We, ha we don't have the closing parenthesis yet. For now on the next line of code, we'll do the second part of the for statement, which is the condition. Our condition is while count is less than or equal to five, the loop is gonna run. When I read a for statement out loud, I insert the word while in front of the condition. So I'll be like for count equals one, while count is less than or equal to five, and then go on to the body. And in my head, that helps me remember like how to interpret the condition. Again, there's another semicolon here to separate the second part of our for statement from the third part, and the third part is gonna be count plus plus. That's the third and final part, so we have a closing parenthesis. This is where we update the loop variable. This is the part that I think is least intuitive about the for statement. Because in our while loop, this happened at the end of the body of our while loop. But here it's part of the for statement. We still need a body of our for loop. We still have the curly brackets, just like we did in the while loop. And we're going to print count, just like we did before. And that's our body. And then at the end, we can print done, just like we did before. This method results in exactly the same output as the first while loop we wrote. It's going to print 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. What I'm going to try to convince you of over the next several days is despite your probably being more comfortable with while loops, for this type of a case where we know this loop's going to run five times, I'm going to encourage you to use a for loop. Um, and here's why. Here's the rationale behind that. The very thing that makes the for loop have a steep learning curve is what eventually helps us write fewer bugs. And the reason for that is in the actual for statement itself, three of the four parts of every looping structure are right here. The initialization is here. The condition is here. Updating the loop variables here. The only thing not here is the body of the loop, which, you know, kind of, of course, has to go in the curly brackets. So having all three of these parts here, while it makes it complicated for us to get used to, in the long run, we're not going to forget these. Because the problem we run into with our while loops is that a common bug in the while loop that programmers make is they, they tend to have the initialization, they tend to have the condition, they forget to update the loop variable, and they end up with some sort of an infinite loop. Or later next week, when we start writing nested loops, that is one loop inside of another loop, putting the initialization in the right place and doing the loop variable update in the right place gets more complicated once we have loops inside of loops. But with the for loop, everything is always in the right place because all three of them are always part of the for loop statement. So take some time to kind of like keep do using for loops until you're comfortable with them and it's going to pay off in the end. Like right here? Yeah, we could so totally say something like count plus equals two. In fact, we can put any statement we want here. Usually we're incrementing, decrementing something, but we can put anything we want there. Yeah. Okay, so I messed around with, okay, so like if you put like the increment and update the for loop variable part, if you just chuck in the body, it would still compile what's the difference between that? Let me see if I understand. So you're saying if we do like a count plus plus here? Here. And then get rid of this? Like that? That will run, but it doesn't give us the same values anymore. Because if we trace through this, we'll initialize count to one. 
we'll check our condition, and then we run the body of the loop, we're going to increment count to 2, so we're going to print 2. So we'll never actually print a 1. We're going to print a 2, and then we'll print a 3, and then we'll print a 4, then we'll print a 5, and then we're actually going to print a 6 as well. Um, so yeah, this is valid. Um, it's kind of odd, we wouldn't normally write it that way, but no, it compiles and it functions. It just behaves differently. Actually, to help with this, let's actually trace through this together. So I'm going to set a breakpoint, um, oh, compile. I'm going to set a breakpoint at the beginning of the for loop. I'm going to make the window a little bit smaller so that I can run this example with the debugger. All right, so again, the, the code highlighted in green is what we're about to run. And this is, I think, let's kind of go through step by step what's, what's going to happen. This should help us out. We're first going to run the initialization part of the for loop. All right, so when I hit step, <coughs> we'll see that we have a local variable count that now has a value of 1. The next line of code that is running is we're checking the condition. Is count less than or equal to 5? Yes, 1 is less than or equal to 5. Here's the thing, though. The next line of code that's going to run when I hit step, it's the body of the loop. We skipped right over the increment part. Okay, and that might be unexpected until we get used to it. We skipped right over it, and now we're going to print 1 to the terminal. The next line of code that's going to execute after the body is done, here, I'm going to move the terminal out of the way. The next line of code that's going to execute when the body is done um, is the count plus plus. Right? So we finished the body, and now we're doing the third part of that for statement. When I hit step, two interesting things are going to happen. Count is going to become two, but also the next line of code that's going to be executed is checking the condition. I think the fact that this line of code executes followed by this line of code, that the flow of execution is backwards, we go to the previous line, I think that's what trips up students until they get used to the for statement. We're going to check is count less than or equal to five. It is, it's true, so now we run the body. And we can see that that's highlighted next. So what we need to get used to is that when the body is done, we update the loop variable, we check the condition. If it's true, we run the body. And this process repeats. At no point do we ever run the initialization again. That only happens once. It happens at the beginning. Eventually, we increment count to 6. So count now has a value of 6. We're checking the condition. Is 6 less than or equal to 5? No, we skip the body and we go to the next line of code after the for statement. So stepping through this, I think, is a key part to seeing how exactly the for loop works. So I encourage you to use the debugger a lot as you get used to this. I encourage you to write each of the three parts in their own line of code. So when the debugger highlights a line, you can visually see what's going on. In addition, in the chapter six slides here, um, I've kind of annotated the same code, and you can actually step through the slides and actually see the order in which things are executed, and I think that's going to be helpful for you as well. All right, let's add one more line of code while we're here, though. Let's say we want to print out the final value of count. So system.out.println final value of count plus count. Here's the thing. It doesn't compile. And this might be unexpected. We get that compiler error that says cannot find symbol variable count. Usually we get this compiler error when I misspell something, but I spelled count correctly. That's good. Um, or we get this compiler error when, so, when a variable isn't in scope. And that's actually what happens here. So let's add a comment explaining what's going on, because this is something you will probably run into. Variables. De ah variables declared within the for statement 
are scoped to the for statement and its body. We're used to variables being scoped to like a pair of curly brackets to that code block. But what's perhaps unexpected here is that this local variable count being declared as part of the for statement is scoped to the for statement and the corresponding body of that for statement. That's it. We can't reference the variable count outside of the highlighted code. So do keep that in mind. Now a reasonable question might be like, well, what if we want to? <laughs> like, how do we fix this? Um, so let's actually copy and paste this entire for example method and make a new method, because I don't want to change any of this. I guess I'm going to comment out the syntax error. So I'm going to paste the method down here. I'm going to change the name to for example two. I'm going to get rid of the comments because they're up above, so everything is a little bit more concise. And I'm going to show you two ways that we can fix this. Because this is a scoping issue, the way to fix it is to change the scope of the variable. And the easiest way to do that is to simply declare count outside of the for statement. We can still choose to initialize it inside of the for statement. We just need to declare the variable outside of the for statement. Because now the scope of the count variable is the entire for example to method, and this is going to compile just fine. So if you need to access your loop variable outside of the loop, just declare it before the loop, and you're fine. Another way we could do this, which is similar, but uh, this shows another feature of for loops, we could actually choose to initialize it here as well. We could actually say int count equals one, and we could get rid of all of this the entire first part of our for loop. And this compiles. This is OK. We still have the semicolon here to separate an empty first part from the second part. Um, but we are not required to have the first part of a for statement, nor are we required to have the second part of a for statement. We could leave that out as well. Um, only the middle, the second part of the for statement, is actually required. The first and third parts are optional. That said, if we get rid of the first and the third part, we just wrote a while statement, and you should just use a while statement. That's kind of silly. Um, but there are times when it's reasonable to leave out maybe the first or the third part. Um, so don't be surprised when you see that. That's OK. That's allowed from a syntax perspective. <laughs> 